Welcome, everybody, and thanks for, for being here. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome uh, Elisabeth Binder. Oh, wait, this time it's going to be only virtual. Um, I'm very pleased to say that Elisabeth is starting to become a regular in Nijmegen. Uh, last year and in pre-corona times, she held the Falkhoff Chair of Rapport UMC, and she's also a member of our Scientific Advisory Board of the Donders Institute. More and more people have collaborations uh, with Elisabeth here from in, at the Nijmegen site. And also today, she's already had a, a full day of talks with different research uh, groups to, um, to collaborate, uh, to, to start new collaborations or continue existing ones. For those of you who don't know Elisabeth, uh, she is the director of the Max Planck Institute of Psychiatry in Munich, in Germany where she also leads the Department of Translational, Psychiatry, uh, Translational Research in Psychiatry. And in addition to that, she holds a professorship at Emory University School of uh, Medicine in Atlanta. Uh, Professor Binder is trained as a medical doctor in Vienna and uh, specialized in psychiatry in Munich. And she received a PhD in uh, neuroscience from Emory University. Looking at Elizabeth's uh, research, um, this uh, evolves around the identification of molecular moderators of the response to environmental factors. And in this uh, has a focus on early trauma and gene environment interactions. Elizabeth studies such, such factors um, that influence trajectories to well-being and uh, psychiatric disease and in that way collects knowledge that can ultimately inform the development of new uh, prevention and treatment strategies. Looking at uh, her research history, her pet gene, as uh, you may call it, uh, from early on has been FKBP5, which is one of those rare genes that actually survived the shift from hypothesis uh, test in candidate gene study era to the genome-wide association study era that we're in now. And she studies the, the molecular pathways linking this gene to by behavioral outcomes in psychiatric diseases. And while doing so has uncovered principles um, uh, that are more generally applicable to how our body deals with stress and how this is moderated by our genetic makeup. For this innovative work, Elizabeth has uh, won uh, a number of prizes and awards and has published over 300 papers. Elizabeth is not only dedicated to her uh, scientific work, but also is very highly involved in determining the direction of science for the future. And she does so, for example, as a member of ECMP, a member of the board of directors of um, the International Society of psychiatric genetics and ECMP, she also is in the board of directors. And she also engages in shaping a more diverse research community um, as a member of the board of directors of the ALBA uh, Network for Equality and Diversity in the Brain Sciences. So I'm, I'm very happy and also be uh, uh, very proud to be able to present such a distinguished member of our scientific community to you here today. In her presentation that will follow now, Elizabeth will show us some of the work from her group, including very new data under the title Deciphering Mechanisms of Gene Environment Interactions of Stress, Possibilities for Individualized Diagnosis and Treatment of Stress-Related Disorders. Elizabeth, with that, I would like to give the floor to you. Yeah, well, thank you very much for this very kind introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be back uh, in Nijmegen, um, even though only virtually. And so far, I really enjoyed my day. I had, uh, had a number of very interesting uh, discussions um, with members, um, local members, and I really hope that we can, can intensify the collaborations that are um, already ongoing. Well, Barbara pretty much already summarized my talk, so um, <laughs> we can dive right in. Um, 
as the title says, um, st stress is definitely on the mind of my research group, but not only them, as you can see from these Time Magazine articles, were, were very, um, yeah, stress is on the minds of everybody and everybody's talking about stress uh, for dads, stress for kids, everybody's stressed. Um, and also um, there are new ways um, that we may be able to deal with stress, mindfulness-based training, for example, is very popular. Um, so even though I use the word stress in my title, um, I, I will talking about more extreme form of stress. And as Barbara already said, um, early adversity, especially childhood maltreatment and child abuse is one of the main risk factors for psychiatric disorders. So these early adversities, and they can happen as early as during pregnancy, and some argue maybe even in the generations before, um, can set off individuals to trajectories um, of disease uh, and increase risk for these disease. Um, but not everybody who's been exposed to these adversities actually develops um, these disorders. And what, in, what I would like to highlight in my talk are moderating factors. Like what are the factors that influences which individuals actually will end up um, having a psychiatric disorder after exposures and which actually will remain resilient or healthy. And I will highlight genetics, developmental timing, um, and also epigenetics as some of the potential mediators um, of these adverse trajectories to risk. So this is just um, I, I, like a, a reminder, um, and this is a very nice um, some, like meta-analysis of a Teich and Samsung are already um, quite a number of years old, uh, really summarizing, summarizing data from um, several tens of thousands of individuals um, showing um, how pervasive um, childhood adversity and childhood trauma increases risk for psychiatric disorders. And it does so for depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety disorders, but also alcohol abuse and substance abuse disorders. So massive increases in risk across the diagnostic spectrum in psychiatry. What has also been shown over the years by a number of different researchers is that exposure to early adversity not only increases risk for psychiatric disorders, but also leaves changes in biological systems such as, for example, an altered stress hormone response um, with often blunted responses um, of cortisol reported in individuals exposed to early adversity or uh, problems with adapting heart rate um, changes to stress and structural and functional changes in the brain. And I'm just highlighting two examples here um, showing that an altered connectivity to the visual cortex in individuals who had witnessed witness domestic violence as children, or a thinning of the part of the cortex um, that's important for genital um, somatosensory areas in individuals or women who had actually witnessed sexual abuse. So strong and lasting effects of childhood trauma, not only on the symptomatic, but also on a number of biological methods. And so the question is, how are these biological changes actually embedded? What is the signal um, that could actually contribute to that? And so I would highlight one system that definitely does not explain all of these changes, um, but could be a system that contributes to the embedding, uh, the lasting embedding of these um, early adversity exposures. So with stress and early adversity, we activate um, stress system. And one of the systems that's activated is the stress hormone system. Uh, would in the end release of glucocorticoids from the adrenal gland. And glucocorticoids um, have receptors in all the tissues and uh, prepare the body for the stress response, uh, for example, the immune system um, and other um, organs. But what it is also very important about the system is that it provides a negative feedback signal when the stress is over to actually shut down the system again. And this balance of activation and inhibition of the system is often disrupted with early adversity, but also within psychiatric disorders. So in my lab, we felt that the glucocorticoid system is an interesting system to study this interaction between genes and environment because it's actually an intracellular receptor um, that when activated 
binds to the DNA at certain response elements and engenders a transcriptional response to stress, changing uh, in a lasting manner the cellular response. And it does so by changing not only the transcription, but also the epigenetic landscape. And this is a cartoon here of these response elements that are binding elements for this nuclear receptor, the glucocorticoid receptor, um, and that is actually embedded in the epigenetic landscape. And so with the epigenetic landscape, you have a tight um, winding of the DNA that may um, limit the accessibility of these response elements to the transcription factor that can actually be opened and then makes the binding and the transcriptional response easier. And this um, has been shown for the glucocorticoid receptor. So when activated and binding to the response elements, it actually not only increases or decreases gene transcription, but leads to a local change in the epigenetic landscape by decreasing DNA methylation and opening the chromatin, making the DNA more responsive to subsequent um, stimulation. And this is something that we wanted to explore a bit more. What are the effects of glucocorticoids on neurons and could these effects actually be associated with what we see uh, in altering risk trajectories for psychiatric disorders? And what is also important is that sort of these molecular changes and epigenetic changes might be moderated by genetic variation and thereby provide a molecular integration uh, for gene environment interactions. So we used um, initially the system, um, hippocamp, human hippocampal progenitor cell line uh, provided by the company Runeuron. And these cells actually can be differentiated into mature um, hippocampal um, neuronal cultures. Um, that uh, have all markers of um, synapse connectivity here and react to glucocorticoids. And our question was, what is actually happening to these cells when we treat them with glucocorticoids and there is an agonist of the receptor called dexamethasone um, during proliferation differentiation, when we let the cells differentiate, differentiate, but most importantly, are these effects lasting and are they dependent on the timing of the treatment? That is, does it matter if we treat early on or once the cells are differentiated? And then at different time points, we measure differences in RNA expression and RNA methylation. So what did we observe? We did observe that we see quite substantial changes in gene expression with glucocorticoid receptor activation as expected, um, especially in these early time points. And we see much less changes after washout, where the stimulus is actually gone. On the DNA methylation or epigenetic side, we also see the most changes when we treat early during proliferation. But we had the second peak here um, of numbers of DNA methylation changes in this period here where we treated early on and then it had a washout. So there are some lasting DNA methylation changes that are not really accompanied by changes in RNA transcription. So we were wondering what are these methylation sites that have these lasting changes, but are not really associated with changes in gene transcription. And when we looked at where in the genome and which functional um, context these CPGs are, we saw that they're enriched A for these glucocorticoid response elements, uh, which was sort of expected but especially the ones that had these lasting effects in bivalent and poised enhancers. And these are enhancers that basically wait for a stimulus to be active and just um, sort of poise a, a site for future activation. And so we wanted to test that hypothesis again in our cellular model. And so what we did is we not only had the setup as before with this um, sort of 10-day exposure to glucocorticoid receptor agonist in the washout um, or vehicle, uh, but we also added an acute challenge to see whether in fact we have a more sensitive transcriptional landscape. And so we looked at all the transcripts that were close um, to the CPG sites that showed these lasting changes in DNA methylation. And what we saw is when we looked at them, uh, in a condition where we first had the exposure 
and then where the washout, only very few actually, as we saw before, showed these changes in gene transcription here. When we looked at these sites with an acute stimulus only, we saw that a few more actually showed this activation. But when we looked at the double hit, a, an early chronic um, exposure, a washout, and an acute re-stimulus, we saw that many more transcripts, over 700, um, actually showed a significant regulation, and also the magnitude of this regulation was actually larger. This suggested to us that maybe uh, one could hypothesize that early exposure to stress and glucocorticoids leads not to lasting changes in gene transcription, but to an epigenetic memory that needs another exposure to be unmasked and then leads to an altered set point uh, in how we react to stress later on and could determine risk and resilience trajectory. And by deciphering these molecular um, signatures, uh, we may also be able to identify new targets that are important um, for treating and understanding stress-related disorders. And so this is just to show you again a summary of the data before in a bit different way. These are um, the DNA methylation sites that were strongly affected by glucocorticoids. And you can see some are demethylated, some are hypermethylated. And often the ones that are demethylated, we see a, an increase in mRNA transcription and they're enriched for important target genes uh, relevant for nervous system development, cell differentiation, neurogenesis, and neuron differentiation. So they could be quite important um, for normal um, development. What was striking to us is that among this very um, unbiased approach, the top candidate was one of the genes that we had worked on for quite a while already, FKBP5, a gene that's actually quite intricately involved in the stress hormone system. And what you can see here again is over the different um, stimulation phases, you have these lasting changes in methylation in these enhancer regions that are not seen when you treat the cells once they're differentiated. And this is not accompanied by changes in gene transcription. And so we wanted to explore this in more detail. And for FKBP5, we actually have an assay where we can better fine map DNA methylation changes. And so what you can see here is a glucocorticoid response element of FKBP5 in intron 7. And you can see that there is a strong decrease in DNA methylation, not just in one of these methylation sites, but in almost all of them that are um, constituting this binding element. So what we then wanted to know, are these changes in DNA methylation actually functional? And so for this, um, we took this DNA element and put it in a reported gene assay, either in a methylated or unmethylated version. And while methylation of these this response element did not change baseline transcription. It actually altered by how much we could induce the reporter ge uh, gene activity uh, with glucocorticoids. So as you can see here in the methylated version, glucocorticoids only induced um, reporter gene activity by a bit, while this was significantly increased in the unmethylated version. So demethylation of these sites could actually lead to a poised transcriptional state. So why do we think that this could be interesting for FKBP5? So FKBP5 is actually a, a target that's very strongly activated by glucocorticoids in many tissues. So these are examples from peripheral blood, from mouse brain here in the central amygdala with the dexamethasone, but we also have data from human brain organoids where we see a very strong consistent um, increase of FKBP5 transcript with glucocorticoids. So FKBP5 is strongly activated by stress and glucocorticoids. And also in many other tissues, which, which will become uh, important later on. So FKBP5 is a protein that actually serves as co-chaperone. So it helps other proteins to fold properly. And it's part of the large complex of the glucocorticoid receptor, which actually is a very interesting um, feed forward feedback loop. So on the one hand, it's strongly activated by the glucocorticoid receptor via these response elements, but as a protein, it goes back and decreases signaling. So an interesting activation inhibition balance. 
But what is also very important is that this activated FKVP5 uh, binds to many other protein pathways and influences them, including calcineurin signaling, the mTOR pathway, autophagy pathways, DNA methyltransferases and DDNF, um, GSK signaling, and wind targets. And these are all pathways that we know are very important for neuronal functioning, synaptic plasticity, or have been shown to be altered in psychiatric and neurodegenerative disorders. So you can imagine when this balance of activation of FKBP5 is actually altered, that this could have a lot of downstream consequences on neuronal functioning, for example. And what has been shown in animal models um, and some human studies is that states of high FKBP5, for example, with overexpression or um, using transgenic animals, lead to a bias to threat, more intrusions of um, traumatic memories, an impaired extinction of fear conditioning, and overall an increased stress sensitivity and anxiety. So all behavioral risk states for psychiatric disorders. And it seems that especially overexpression of FKBP5 in the amygdala and the hippocampus are relevant for that. And this is just an illustration from uh, a data from a colleague of mine, Matthias Schmidt, where overexpression of FKBP5 here in the basolateral amygdala leads to increased anxiety uh, in these animals. So regulating the amount of FKBP5 that it is induced is critical. And I've shown you before that this is done mainly via this response element, that this is a schematic. There are, there are actually a few more response elements in the site and also by 3D reorganization of the locus. So this is very important here. Um, this activation is actually regulated by genetic variants. Um, and there is a genetic variance that actually either does or does not bring a glucocorticoid response element in contact with the transcription start site. And so in, this is one um, SNP variant here that actually in one allele form has this 3, 3D conformation that then leads to an increase in activation with glucocorticoids. So genetic variation can alter the sensitivity. And as I showed you before, the same goes for epigenetic variation. Um, if you have a decrease in DNA methylation in some of these response elements, you also have an increased activation. And if you have the joint genetic and epigenetic effect, you have a dual disinhibition here. So genetic and epigenetics can contribute to regulating the amount of FKBP5 that's actually produced. So the question that we had, could there be a genotype dependent prime response um, also um, to adversity? And so what we had seen, um, and we and others have now shown that in different cohorts, is that when you look at early trauma, there seems to be a decrease in DNA methylation in uh, these DNA uh, glucocorticoid response elements, but only in the individuals who carry this high activity genotype. So basically, only in a certain genotype conformation do you see a decrease in DNA methylation that would be accompanied with higher FKBP5 activation. And so if we find map, for example, this glucocorticoid response element here in intron 7, we see that only the combination of trauma exposure and genetic um, variant actually leads to a decrease in DNA methylation. And these are the exact same CPGs that I showed you before that are demethylated when we expose this human hippocampal progenitor cell and to the GR agonist. So we think it's really maybe higher exposure to glucocorticoids um, that lead, could lead to this demethylation. But we wanted to look at this in more detail also in peripheral blood and for this, a graduate student of mine actually looked at DNA methylation of that site after dexamethasone stimulation um, in repeated blood measures. And when we do that, we actually get a nice suppression of the HPA axis um, with ACTH and cortisol going down and a nice increase of FKBP5 mRNA. That actually we were back to baseline here for the transcriptional response in 24 hours. Um, so um, Tobias then looked at DNA methylation at the same time point. And what he saw is that when we look at these glucocorticoid response elements um, of FKBP5, 
there is in sort of parallel to the increase in uh, mRNA transcription, a decrease in DNA methylation um, at specifically the binding motifs of the glucocorticoid receptor. Um, but this actually reverts back to baseline within 24 hours. So a quite dynamic process of demethylation and remethylation. So we then wanted to know how the genotype actually impacts that dynamic, these dynamic changes in DNA methylation. And this is an example of one of the CPGs in, in TRANS7, but we actually saw this effect on a number of other CPG sites that actually with this high activity um, allele, we see more of a demethylation. So there seems to be an increase in, in dynamics also on the epigenetic side with um, that genotype. And this, for example, was the exact same CPGs that you see demethylated with trauma in the risk of your carriers. So the question is, we have a very dynamic um, activity here. And what seems to be more stable since the trauma happened in child abuse here. And so the question is, and this is still ongoing research, what actually confers the stability um, of DNA methylation changes? And so one idea that, that we're looking into is to actually understand um, what is different when we treat with glucocorticoids early on uh, than when we treat once cells are differentiated. Uh, because here we have these lasting effects and we don't see them here. Um, we're now trying to actually do this by um, co-IP experiments, uh, what actually comes with glucocorticoid receptor binding early on what are other maybe epigenetic factors that co-bind to these regions um, that would actually confer the stability. And on the human side, we were also wondering, does it matter when the trauma happens? Does it matter whether the trauma happens in adulthood or in childhood for seeing these lasting epigenetic changes? And so what we did see um, in a first cohort um, in Atlanta is that the FKBP5 genotype, when we look at symptom presentation, interacts with child abuse here to predict, for example, symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorders, um, where individuals who have no abuse have no genotype effect, but individuals with severe child abuse and this enhancing FKBP5 genotype actually have higher levels um, of symptoms with exposure to child abuse. So gene environment interactions that we do not see in individuals um, with adult trauma. So while adult trauma increases risk for post-traumatic stress disorder, this is not moderated um, at um, the genotype level. And we think that only in the context of child abuse, and this is what we saw, do we actually see changes in DNA methylation. So that you actually need the genetic and the epigenetic factors to come together to disinhibit FKVT5. This interaction of FKVT5 with childhood adversity to predict psychiatric symptoms has actually now been seen in many more studies. Um, this is a snapshot from two years ago. Um, and what is interesting that it, it goes across psychiatric disorders. Um, so we see it for depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, but also personality disorder and, and, and substance abuse. And it's seen in children as, um, as well as adults. So we do not see main effects of FKVP5, but interactions with trauma that happens early on and not um, with adversity that happens later in life. So there seems to be some developmental timing issue that could be related um, to these changes in DNA methylation. So the hypothesis that, that we're following up is that there is an early exposure to stress um, that would actually change the epigenetic landscape of target genes, for example, FKBP5, and change the genomic set point um, at which this gene actually responds. And in the case of FKBP5, higher um, activity of FKPP5 with stress by interacting with many downstream pathways could change the neural response uh, by acting back on the glucocorticoid receptor system lead to a prolonged stress response. This is what has been shown. Um, and also change um, 
circuits that are important um, for psychiatric disorders uh, lead to differences in um, anxiety and stress coping as we see in animal studies. And we also see that this could be related to increased uh, risk for psychiatric disorders um, from the large set of human studies. So an altered FKPP5 set point by genetic and environmental and epigenetic factors um, could actually lead to specific changes um, of the stress response and neural function and could maybe constitute a specific subtype um, of disease that could present itself um, with different symptoms um, as we've seen this transdiagnostic increase in risk. So one idea that we actually developed when we had invited back when Corona was not an issue, Clancy Blair uh, from NYU um, to talk to us here in Munich uh, was the concept of self-regulation. And self-regulation is a concept that very early on um, children have to develop um, emotion regulation in order to focus and maintain attention, um, to be able to reflect on information and experience, and to then be able to engage in sustained positive social interactions. And the idea was, is that genes that alter the stress physiology would also alter emotional reactivity and executive function, and thus this complex of stress of self-regulation, so that very early on self-regulation could be impaired that could then lead downstream to emotional and behavioral, but also academic problems and maybe in the end to increase risk for psychiatric disorders. So um, Clancy actually has, um, uh, is collaborating with a great cohort, the family uh, life partner cohort, where they had collected um, or investigated um, over uh, 1,200 children um, over time, uh, starting at seven months of age and ending in when the kids were in fifth grade. Uh, with repeated measures um, assessing um, early on emotion reactivity uh, were um, to a mask challenge at home, um, where they also measured cortisol. There were repeated measures of executive function, uh, for example, when the kids were 60 months old. And in schools, there were teacher-rated behavioral problems, but also um, objective measures of reading and math abilities. And Together with Clancy, we said, wouldn't it be interesting to look whether the interaction of FKBP5 genotype uh, with early adversity, and in this case, it was in, uh, like witnessing intimate partner violence at home that was measured um, between seven months and 24 months of age, and that had Clancy had shown before was a strong um, uh, adversity for these children. Uh, would we actually see? differences in the developmental trajectory of these children. And so for this, we looked at all of these measures together and then actually looked at trajectories over time. And so you can see these were these early trajectories for cortisol reactivity and motion reactivity. And we saw that half of the kids had high reactivity on cortisol and motion uh, and emotion reactivity and half had lower um, activity there. And similarly, for emotional and behavioral difficulties in reading and math, we saw two types of trajectories emerge. And when we compared these trajectories, um, we actually identified four subgroups that either had high um, reactivity before and low later, um, or different types of combinations here. And so you can see there are kids here that especially at 24 months, show a high cortisol reactivity, but also show high levels of emotional and behavioral difficulty. And what, what we wanted to know is whether a kid being on this high risk trajectory, starting at seven months uh, and ending in fifth grade, would be influenced by interpersonal violence witnessed in the first two months of life and FKBP5 genotype. And so this is actually what we saw. Uh, and so these are um, kids that are on this high risk trajectory, high cortisol, high emotional reactivity early on, and a lot of problems in school, or this low um, trajectory. And what we did see is that kids who actually were in this low risk trajectory were four times less likely to have experienced interpersonal violence and to have this high risk genotype for FKBP5. 
So actually, FKBP5 was associated with these risk trajectories. And so when we looked at this in a bit more detail here, this is the cortisol reactivity stratified by, so over time here, pre-stress, 20 minutes post-stress, and then 40 minutes post-stress. And so what we did see in kids with high, with high intrapersonal violence and two of the risk alleles, there were, there were sort of a slowing or delay in actually um, decreasing the cortisol response over stress. And this was even more accentuated uh, at 24 months, so that actually the kids here um, sort of already um, had habituated to, to the task, where, whereas these kids with the dual environmental and genetic risk still showed this high activity of cortisol. And similar patterns um, as for this sort of delayed in, um, uh, in reducing the cortisol response was seen for emotion reactivity that was higher in the kids with the dual exposure these kids also had lower executive function, especially in the context of um, the, the two alleles here. And these kids also um, had lower reading and math ability and more emotional and behavioral problems um, across all the grades. So overall, it seems that a combination of early trauma and two copies of this FKBP5 risk allele and presumably higher FKBP5 activation leads to a prolonged cortisol response, increased emotional reactivity, uh, lower executive function, and more emotional and behavioral problems, and worse academic achievements. And that altogether, this could actually set up um, these kids for an increased risk for psychiatric um, disorders. So the question is what can we do? Can we moderate these risk trajectories early on by maybe also? Um, uh, intervening uh, with, ta uh, with treatments really targeting self-regulation early on, for example. So in the last um, part of my talk, um, I, I want to go a bit beyond um, behavioral problems um, because we know that um, whilst chronic stress uh, and, and uh, child abuse are associated with psychiatric disorders, they're also associated with a number um, of risk factors for age-related diseases like um, higher immune reactivity, CRP. And maybe FKBP5 could also contribute to this risk that um, uh, child abuse and chronic stress actually also have um, by their effects on different brain organs, fat tissue, um, with insulin resistance, immune cells, but also muscle cells. Uh, and so really looking at stress and aging and whether FKBP5 could actually also be part um, of, of that risk trajectory here. So this is um, a picture from Brain Cloud showing FKBP5 expression um, over development. So this is prenatal, uh, postnatal development. And you can see that here, starting with puberty, there's a strong increase of FKBP5 expression um, in the brain. And so we were interested um, in that uh, and collaborated uh, with a group in Florida where we actually looked at, at many brains in Alzheimer's disorders where FKBB5 is also increased. But what we did see is with age, there was not only an increase of FKBP5 RNA and protein, but also a decrease specifically in these glucocorticoid response elements uh, of intrad 7 that I showed you that are responsive um, to stress. And so we wanted to look at that also in a tissue that's more accessible to us, peripheral blood. And what we did see also is the DNA methylation. Um, and these were additional sites that are in the promoter of FKBP5, showed a very strong um, demethylation, highly significant, seen across uh, many samples and uh, different cohorts. So we wanted to understand the epigenetic change with age better, and especially in the context of depression and early adversity. And so what we did see is that when we looked at epigenetic aging trajectory uh, in individuals that did not show depression and depressed individuals, there was an acceleration of this epigenetic aging in patients with depression. And similarly, um, in a cohort uh, where individuals were over 64 years of age and half of them had experienced an early life separation uh, when they were uh, between six months to two years old and the other half had not. 
to show that individuals with this early life separation or individuals with FKBP5 actually had lower levels um, um, of DNA methylation um, at these sites here. So we wanted to understand whether this lower methylation would actually also be associated with higher reactivity of FKBP5. And so that's what we did here. We stratified individuals per their methylation score in low versus high. And then we looked at the correlation between cortisol the, and the um, activator of the glucocorticoid re receptor and FKBP5 mRNA. And we have shown, many have shown before that there's a positive correlation because GR activates FKBP5. And this activation is actually steeper um, with lower methylation. So higher activity of FKBP5 or higher activation of FKBP5 with lower methylation. The same is true when we stratify by, by age. So older individuals also seem to have this higher, um, so, so being more prone to have FKB5 activated with higher cortisol level. Uh, and this is an, an, an analysis where we combine depression and childhood trauma. And so if we take individuals who have high childhood trauma scores and also have higher depression scores, these are the ones that show the most disinhibition of FKBP5 with high cortisol level. So there seems to be a change in set point also in immune cells with depression and child abuse that could be related to these changes in DNA methylation. So we wanted to understand better what does this high FKBP5, what could that actually mean for the immune system? And so when we looked at FKBP5 expression, um, it actually co-correlates with a large number of transcripts. And these transcripts are actually enriched for inflammation and for NF-kappa-B binding. And so when we look at the correlation of FKBP5 with specific factors, we see positive correlations with genes that have been shown to be pro-inflammatory and negative correlations with genes that have been shown to be anti-inflammatory. And so we wanted to explore that more, especially in the context of NF-kappa B binding. And NF-kappa B is a very important um, pro-inflammatory activator. And so what we looked at was the co-expression of FKBP5 um, with um, members of the NF-kappa B pathway in individuals who had either low expression or high expression of FKBP5. And so we constructed these co-expression networks here, and you can see there's a different shape um, and connectivity level of that network, suggesting there's an altered um, activation also of that NF-kappa B pathway here. And what was most striking is that there was a reversal um, of a correlation um, of two members of the pathways, CHUK and MAP3 kinase 14. And these on the protein level, are actually called I kappa alpha and NIC. And these are essential drivers of the um, NF kappa B pathway. And the NF kappa B pathway actually has two pathways a classical pathway and an alternate pathway. And the alternate pathway actually has NIC and I kappa alpha that actually um, form a protein complex that then leads to all these downstream activations um, uh, of NF kappa B. And so what we could show in a series of co-IP experiments and also using a pharmacological agent that blocks FKBP5, that FKBP5 actually in the protein level directly binds here to this complex and um, blocks the phosphorylation of I kappa alpha and thereby um, alters the whole activation of the NF kappa B pathway. So FKBP5 increases this activity here of I kappa alpha and by this NF kappa B signaling. So what we could show is that there are DNA methylation sites here that change with age, and this changes with age is accelerated with childhood trauma and major depression. In FKBP5, um, this actually leads to an increase in FKBP5. And FKBP5, we could show directly activates um, NF-kappa B. So FKBP5 um, is an interaction partner of NF-kappa B. And NF-kappa B 
has a binding site in the promoter of FKBP5. So there seems to be a feed forward loop um, that is started with this demethylation of this binding site, increasing FKBP5 and FKBP B, and then again binding to the promoter of FKBP5, making more of it. And higher FKBP5 leads to higher chemotaxis and inflammation, and could also be associated with risk for myocardial uh, infarction. So what we could see when we looked at two different cohorts is that patients who have a history of myocardial infarction actually had lower levels of DNA methylation um, at these specific sites. So one idea of how this could come together is that in a, in a younger individuals with higher levels of DNA methylation, um, stress and cortisol actually will only increase FKBP5 a bit, whereas when FKBP5 DNA methylation is reduced with age and other factors, this actually leads to much higher increases in FKBP5, starting this sort of vicious cycle of activation, leading to higher levels of inflammation with all the consequences for a number of factors, cardiovascular risk, but it also could um, happen in different tissues um, with different types of risk. So why did I bring up um, this other angle um, of aging and immune in the context of FKBP5 and this initial idea of early maltreatment and developmental trajectories? So what I've shown you is that there is a genotype in FKBP5 that alters its responsivity to stress. By itself, this does not really seem to alter risk and never comes up in any GWAS, but it needs um, exposure to adver adversity and most likely additional epigenetic changes to lead to a disinhibition of FKBP5. And only then would you activate maybe trajectories to risk. And this increase in FKPP5 has consequences in different tissues. And I showed you examples um, on brain cells and neurons, but also on immune cells um, that could lead to differences in circuit activation, but also differences in immune activation leading to disease outcomes. So that maybe individuals who have this combined disinhibition of FKPP5 um, show impaired self-regulation early in life um, at transdiagnostic psychiatric risk and maybe later in life an increased risk for age-related disease. But that these individuals, even though their presentation of symptoms is quite diverse, could benefit from different targeted intervention at different time points. Like early therapy, psychotherapeutic invention targeting um, self-regulation that could maybe prevent that um, risk trajectory. Maybe um, antagonists of FKBP5 to block hyperactivity to reduce uh, transdiagnostic psychiatric risk. And maybe lifestyle factors or specific medication choice also for psychiatric um, patients um, to degree, decrease the risk for age-related diseases. Um, so overall, by understanding maybe a molecular mechanism that, the mechanism that contributes to risk, identify biomarkers that could lead us to a more targeted uh, and time-dependent in intervention um, for our patients. And with this, I'd like to finish my talk and thank you for your attention and a large number um, of uh, team members here at the Max Planck Institute of Psychiatry, uh, but also at Emory University uh, and all over um, the world um, for um, collaborations. So thank you very much.